ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today uh, to discuss with you the challenges we all face in this one and only globe planet we have together. And I'm going to speak to you about the Nordic experience or Scandinavian, whichever name you prefer. I use Nordic because in the tightest uh, geographical term, Scandinavia actually excludes Finland. <laughs> so, so that's why I use Nordic, but it's often used as parallel with Nordic, so I know that as well. Fennoskandia is the official geographical name to include Finland. Um, Finland is the land of, of thousands of lakes. Our archipelagos have thousands of small islands in tight clusters. That's where I spend my time fishing in the summer. Our land area is covered two-thirds by forests. And in northern Finland, air quality is measured to be the best in the inhabited continents. So we do have a lot to be proud of when it comes to the environment, a lot of uh, environment to protect. And even though a majority of Finns live today in cities, most have access to summer cottage or house in the countryside or by some other means go to spend their sum summer or autumn in, in, in the woods by collecting, uh, um, for example, uh, mushrooms. Those we have plenty of in, in our woods. So there is a close relationship to nature in, in the Finnish DNA. And I guess that's something which, when you start to discuss about environmental responsibility and our relationship with nature, uh, that I often see as a, like, a, like a key ingredient to what kind of environmental discussion people have in, in, in that, that two people feel that nature is something distinctly different from us, something which we are not part of, something which is outside, you know, the civilized uh, society? Or do we realize that actually we are very small ingredients and parts of the same uh, natural system as any other species, and our actions uh, affect nature in a multitude of, of ways every day? If we kind of think that you know, we can drive cars and we can use whatever energy we want and we can live everyday lives by buying a lot of stuff without thinking the consequences to the nature and not seeing the relationship of our consumerism towards how uh, the natural, natural world can uh, renew itself and, and provide us basic livelihoods like clean water and, and, uh, and uh, clean air, then we, we don't have the capabilities of have to have politics which can also solve these problems. So that means that we in, in Finland are at a well place to solve environmental issues, but it's not easy for us either. It's not automatic in Finland to be uh, positive to the protection of nature. Uh, and therefore I would like to also address here some issues which we have had uh, difficulties with, with and which we have tried to um, address. Um, Firstly, I would like to take a more global view, since these challenges are, are similar in essence all around the world. And, and when it comes to, to uh, the expansion of human activity in the last hundred years, as a minister of the environment, it was um, interesting in the global meetings, we, we meet about biodiversity protection, or we meet about uh, addressing climate change, that how there is such a multitude of, of uh, problems that humanity is creating when it comes to nature's different limits and, and how few of them are understood by, by uh, politics and societies and, and, and the economic system uh, in general. And there is a very famous Swedish uh, uh, researcher, Johan Rockström, who has made this, this uh, 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 diagram about uh, uh, planetary boundaries, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite famous in that sense that it includes the most dangerous different uh, environmental challenges that we are facing at the same time, and it's a good way of understanding that it's not just a question of climate change or air pollution that we are facing, that basically the way we consume and product energy, move around, live in houses, buy stuff, produce food, all of this creates different kind of uh, pressures towards, towards uh, the natural world, and in many ways these boundaries are exceeded. The natural world cannot continue to give the same kind of services, ecosystem services it gives to us 
uh, in the future if we continue exceeding this. And these nine planetary boundaries that, that Rockström has identified includes issues like freshwater use. We are still there as a, uh, at the global level in the safe zone, but that's an issue which is very, very well known here, I would say. In California, there is uh, not enough fresh water for the future, so you have to think about how to manage fresh water in a resource efficient way. In China, they are going to run out of fresh water in 20 years. But this is on, on green in that, in, in that sense that we do have ways of addressing this issue. There are still a lot of um, uh, water sources that are not used, and also salt water can be turned into uh, potable water. So this is an issue that can be addressed, but it's, it's also an issue of social justice, how fresh water access is shared. It's a basic livelihood, and, and like UN has come to acknowledge that it is something that has to be accessible also for the poor people of the world. Uh, not having access to fresh water is actually one of the biggest reasons for, for uh, sickness for children and even deaths of children in, in places like, like uh, the most vulnerable parts of Africa and, and in places like India. Often, this uh, uh, not having access to fresh water is also does include a lot of the other areas. I'm just naming a few of these. Uh, we have problems with the biochemical flows, which means that nitrogen is r slowly running out, uh, uh, and nitrogen is need needed for agricultural production. So if we don't have access to nitrogen, the, the nitrogen that ca can be uh, used uh, 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 or excavated as a mineral is, is also uh, uh, limited. Uh, so that, that is something we need to make sure that Nitrogen is, is a nutrient emission that creates eutrophication on the seas, so it makes the seas uh, quality become worse. Uh, so since we need nitrogen to have it on the ground, why do we allow emissions of this valuable nitrogen to end up in the seas and, and make it eutrophied? A lot of things that doesn't make any sense in the way we use resources, but we do have technologies where we can tackle these issues. Phosphorus is another issue which creates emissions to, to uh, seas, especially nearby where there's a lot of human population, and this is something which I come uh, deeper into in, in the Finnish example soon. Then we have ocean acidification, and this is an issue which is related to climate change. Uh, there has been a lot of research in the last uh, 10 years about ocean acidification uh, becoming more and more increased, especially in the polar areas, Due to, due to uh, the effects of, of, uh, of uh, climate change and CO2 uh, amounts in, in the sea. So it becomes uh, acidified, and that is also affecting ecosystems. And to put it short, when humans affect ecosystems by uh, creating climate change or so emissions or so creating acidification or chemicals uh, going to the seas or, or waterways, almost always this effect is negative because we and the natural world has tried to acclimatize itself for the conditions we have today. Any change is something which, which uh, can hazard uh, the features of, of some species. Um, so I'm just saying this uh, because often people think about uh, biodiversity, uh, protection of forests or protection of, of, of um, uh, sea quality or water quality or climate change as separate issues, but this is all a, like a common challenge uh, which comes down to what kind of economic structures we have, how we can turn consumption and production to be sustainable. Okay, this is the global situation, and then I'll just uh, go to the Nordic local examples of, of what this means back home in, in Finland and, and the rest of, of Scandinavia. Um, I'll start with uh, the Baltic Sea. Actually, my interest towards uh, nature started when I was a kid. I remember when I was about 10 years old, I wanted to be an explorer. I sat in my, my uncle's uh, summer cottage by the sea. It looks a bit like that there, around there as well. And, uh, and sat on the rock and thought about the you know, sea. And we have the nice archipelago and, and, and it's nice to go around there fishing and, and learning about the nature and, and realizing the differences. 
of uh, what 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 man's action does to to the to nature as well because the Baltic Sea was not that polluted in the 60s and 70s when my my father was young and when I was young in the 80s it was still you know it was getting worse and worse and in the end in the late 80s early 90s it was uh, quite bad the normal visibility of seawater in the regions like like the uh, archipelago in Turku uh, would be something like at least two meters, up to four meters. The, how deep do you, can, you can see in the water when you're by the water, when you f uh, go swimming or, so well, or, or something. Uh, but in parts of, of the archipelago, the visibility went down to 10 centimeters. So you can see that we have created different kind of conditions by uh, mostly by creating nutrient emissions from agriculture from uh, fishing uh, uh, industry, which had this uh, um, uh, uh, fishing uh, production uh, of, 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 of fish uh, in, in sen sensitive areas. Then we've had uh, common uh, wastewater systems, which created too much uh, emissions as well. And then we have had tried to address all of those uh, since the beginning of the 90s. Actually, not protection of the Baltic Sea started already in the 70s when we formed with all the countries that uh, border in the Baltic Sea, the Helcom Helsinki Commission, which has tried to create uh, cross-border solutions in protecting of the sea. But I would say that the real results have, have been visible in the last 10 years. So this shows how long term it is to try to fix a problem that we have created. But our basic philosophy nowadays the, is that the Baltic Sea, it's one of the worst polluted seas in the world. Uh, it's not because we created a lot more mi missions than the rest of the world, but it's a very close sea and it's not very deep sea. So whatever we do affects it, it greatly. Uh, when you create emissions by the, by the Pacific Ocean, you can see... I guess it's showing you. The Pacific Ocean is this big and the Baltic Sea is that big. So, so basically, uh, if we create... Uh, as countries, big as countries as Russia, Poland, Germany, Finland, and the Baltic States, Sweden, and Denmark, by the Baltic Sea, we created a lot of emissions, and the Baltic Sea doesn't get so much new about the outside of the Danish Straits. They are very small and narrow. So, so it became one of the most polluted seas in the world, especially the eutrophication, too much nutrients in the water, created conditions where, where the ecosystem changed uh, drastically. And we have now tried to turn our agriculture into one which has, which protects that there are no leaks to the sea, that we keep the nutrients into the ground, like the nitrogen which is needed. So we have changed the way we, you know, use uh, uh, fertilizers in, in agriculture, created uh, new kinds of methods of, of making sure that the land doesn't get eroded. Uh, we have also uh, increased the quality of waste, wastewater treatment. Finland and the EU has financed and helped Russia to take care of St. Petersburg wastewaters. St. Petersburg emissions have gone down by 98%. And the condition of the Finnish Gulf, which is the small part of the Baltic Sea between Finland, Russia and Estonia, uh, there we can see the most visible changes for the better. It's actually uh, the outer emissions uh, of nutrients has diminished by 60% in the Finnish Gulf in the last 10 years. So that's a remarkable result. And some parts, eastern parts of the archipelago, the visibility is back to four meters in, 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 in uh, outer archipelago. So we can also say, see that when we change the way we produce um, uh, food and, and how we take care of waste, we can actually um, solve the environmental problems. And this is an interesting issue because I'm, I'm coming down to comparing the United States and other countries later on a bit more, but also in this protection of the seas, that in Finland and Sweden especially, but slowly in the Baltic states and in Russia, uh, companies and, and owners of companies also have started to realize that this is in their interest as well, that it's good economy to create solutions where you can purify water and, and, and make sure that you don't create emissions to the, to the sea. Because this is a global issue. Uh, we know that the Chinese have destroyed a lot of their uh, clean water. 80% of, of uh, waterways in China are heavily polluted, so they need to start to clean it up. 
So the ones who develop the new technologies are the ones who are selling it to the rest of the world as well. So if Mr. Trump has a problem of understanding the severity of climate change or, or by diversity loss or, or the problems the environment is facing, he should at least, even those kind of politicians and, 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 and company owners should realize the economics in solving these issues. Because the cost of having such a um, uh, polluted Baltic Sea is high. And I will name one example for that. Uh, there are over 200,000 boat owners in Finland, something like 400,000 uh, cottages. A lot of them are by the sea. So all those people want to do recreation, use services, spend their time by the sea. And a lot of uh, Germans, Swedes, who come by their boats and, and enjoy those services in the archipelago, if it's heavily polluted, nobody comes. If you take care of the sea, then it's, it's more and more recreational. So our environmental philosophy is that protecting nature is good for the economy and it also creates a better uh, living standard for people. I'm not talking specifically about air pollution, but there are similar stories there. Which, have, which we have tackled when it comes to the industries. And having uh, fresh air, we have, relatively speaking, one of the most fresh air in Europe. That's a big uh, issue of, of, of competitiveness as well. I mean, people live longer uh, when, when you don't have um, air quality problems. Uh, small particulates are still one of the biggest reasons of deaths in Europe. And in Central Europe, it's due to energy sources like coal burning, unclean coal burning, or traffic. So addressing the issues of carbon dioxide emissions addresses also the issue of uh, small particulates which kill people in the short term. Then I'll, if this goes forward, it doesn't. Okay, uh, then a few words about forests and, and uh, national parks and, and protection of, of biodiversity on land. As I said, in Finland, we have something like two thirds of the area is uh, covered by forests. But to be honest, a lot of that forest is not so, you know, in good condition. In southern Finland, uh, we have a, like the northern Finland is scarce. It's like not exactly as distant as northern Canada, but you know that the areas in also uh, here which are more distant, so 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 there may be. A, a larger share of um, area are uh, forests and protected. So in northern Finland, we may have up to 20% of, of forest area is protected. But in southern, southern Finland, where most of the people live, only 2% of fo forests are protected, and only 4% of fore forests are old forests. So those which are not yet protected should be protected. And the very interesting development we've had in the last five years is that national parks are becoming more and more important for the regional economies to get in income. They bring the kind of income which is also more sustainable in the future because service industry, restaurants, uh, hotels get more visitors and, and, and more employment uh, due to, to the increased interest in national parks. We are a population of 5.4 million and our national parks have visitors uh, up to 1.3 million every year. So that would mean like every fifth American would go to a national park every year. Probably not happening here yet, but, but you have some great national parks. So you should realize what kind of like a, a long-term economic solution it is also to take care of the national parks and sustainable forestry, because that, what we have counted, creates more well-being and money than economic uh, exploitation in the short term that would uh, uh, jeopardize the future of these, these, especially the most vulnerable forest areas. We've had some issues of exploitation of minerals like, like um, mining in some sensitive areas, but we have decided not to allow mining in the most uh, sensitive areas, basically due to that most uh, mines create incomes only for 20 years, but taking care of that nature creates uh, uh, ecosystem resources that last gen centuries and generations and generations, but also create income that lasts in generations. So, so that the ecotourism is actually uh, 
better in the short term also, also for the economy than, than over-exploitation. I'm not saying that you can't mine anywhere, we need resources, but at the same time we also need to move the focus of use of resources from virgin sources to renewable recycled sources. And that is something I will go into in my last, last comments before we go into discussion. Uh, climate change is probably the biggest challenge of, of humanity when it comes to environmental issues. And uh, I guess a lot of people have kind of like, since climate change is such an overarching challenge that affects everything we do ev in our everyday life. So my feeling is that often people become kind of like they feel guilty about hearing discussion about climate change because they often think that, okay, then I would have to also change something in my life. So it would be better that it's not true and we shouldn't talk about it because that's kind of, it feels difficult. I become kind of like uh, affected by it that I would like to just continue in my life in this, this narrow safe area and hope that it's not true. But this is the kind of uh, mentality that we don't have, we can't afford anymore. It's going to be very costly if we don't fix this now. Every scientific uh, evidence shows that, that uh, we have to get the global emissions down in the last five, uh, next five years, or otherwise the costs of, of rising temperatures are so high that it would jeopardize the whole economic system and in the end the well-being of, of our children and, and our future. And if you think about your age, most of you are in your 20s, you will still live in something like the latter part of this century, even in up to like 2000, uh, 2090s. And the scale of, of um, environmental degradation and climate change we have today would mean that we would have something like five degrees warmer globe in, in those days. And that would means, mean in most adaptation models, more desertification, something like 50% of the world's agricultural area is under extreme weather uh, phenomena, so a lot less food. That would mean also rising sea levels up to one meter. That would mean totally out of control extreme weather uh, phenomena, it would also be very costly for the economy because there would be a lot of things to fix. And this is not something we want to happen. And in, in the Scandinavian countries and, and in Finland, we have actually taken quite uh, drastic measures to show that the economy and well-being of our citizens also in the short term is in accordance with addressing climate change. So we are not giving up anything by addressing those issues first, uh, uh, but we are also making kind of like a pathway towards hope for the rest of the humanity as well. This is a picture of Helsinki, our capital, during the winter. I hope we have still ice there in the winter time. Sometimes nowadays it's not always happening, so we see the weather changing also in, in Finland. But what we are doing is, when I was the Minister of the Environment, we created national legislation called Climate Act, where we legislated in, in uh, uh, the law that we will diminish our, our cut our emissions from 1990 levels to 2050 by at least 80%. And this is kind of like an overarching legislation which uh, uh, forces all levels of government to think about how they can do things in a different manner. But I would like to say this as a positive challenge, because a lot of the things we do raises quality of, of, of living, addresses issues of pollution in the, in the uh, uh, living environment, makes more choices for people how they can move around. And this is a, probably an issue that what has to be also discussed in the US, that if you kind of like have the urban sprawl like you have in many cities, and you only rely on cars, that would create a city where everybody is just, just sitting in traffic jams one or two hours every day, and, and you still create high emissions, but everybody is unhappy because it's not very nice to sit in a traffic jam. So if you invest in public transportation instead, you get a lot of uh, more like freedom of movement that you can uh, use buses, trams, uh, metro, in bigger cities like in Helsinki, we have all of those, and we are investing more on all of those. Then we have invested a lot in cycling. It's actually 
very good for uh, the health of our citizens, that we have increased the amount of people who cycle to work, almost like doubling it in the last 10 years, and we are almost in the Arctic Circle, so, so <laughs> it's possible to cycle to work there as well. Uh, and it's something like 20% of people in Helsinki cycle to work. And this is very important when we do a lot of jobs where we just sit by the computer. So a lot of the solutions where we are addressing climate change or environmental challenges are also solutions where we can think that how we can make everyday life nicer, healthier, uh, more flexible. We are thinking about being flexible, about or saying to companies, and the public sector has tried to do so as well, that all employment uh, offices don't start their work at 8 o'clock as we do usually. Some start 9, some start, start 10, especially the parents who have small kids. They can come, come later on so they can take care of their kids easier in the morning. It's not so hectic to go to kindergarten. And then you have less traffic jams also in, in the streets when you try to, try to um, uh, make the uh, congestion hours uh, less, less um, uh, extreme. And also, uh, working at distance is something we have been promoting. That was a project I started when I was the Minister of the Environment. That the whole nature of work is changing. We don't need to go to a certain specific location to work. There's a lot of freedom in that, that how you organize your work in skilled labor and, and uh, all different kinds of uh, sectors of life. So we have more and more the kind of like places where people can uh, together close their home to go to a kind of this kind of work, work hostel where you can rent a small room and stay at in your own small city, work in an environment with other people in a similar branch. You may get support if you are a small entrepreneur, you get support in accounting and all that in that small hostel. Uh, but you don't have to travel 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers to your regular working office every day. Uh, or if you are an, an entrepreneur who works by yourself, you don't have to work alone. So I'm just saying all these solutions that, that I think the growth of economy is more and more services, less and less uh, material consumption. Uh, the future of energy production is that we will need less energy when we have low carbon houses, houses built of wood, houses built uh, in a modern fashion which doesn't need so much uh, energy to warm up. That's important in Finland because it's gold. Uh, we can also give, uh, create, in, even in Finnish condition, passive energy houses. The technology is there. So, so if we take all this into use, it's a very heavy investment also, which needs uh, economic growth in these sectors, which create also, also industrial jobs in sectors which have, have a future. So that is what we are trying to do. Uh, I'm not saying that 23 million people in Scandinavia can save the rest of the world, but uh, just you know, a hint to you Americans, the Chinese are very interested in what we are doing and buying a lot of that stuff and trying to do a lot of that stuff by themselves. And if the Chinese are thinking that this is smart, you should also think it's smart. Uh, I will end up here and, and uh, open the floor to questions. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I've enjoyed my day in the campus and, and just, you know, noticing how wonderfully international your approach to everything is. Thank you. Okay, we, we have some time uh, for, uh, for questions, and the way that we thought that we would do this is that um, this is being recorded uh, right now, and so uh, if you have a question, if you could come up here to the microphone and you can um, uh, say your name, what you're studying, and, uh, and you can uh, ask your question. Um, you can make a, a line here, and we'll go till about the hour, and I understand people have classes and things like that they might need to get to, so we'll go. Those who would like to remain uh, for just a few minutes longer, we thought we might turn off the cameras and the recording and have a little bit more intimate kind of um, discussion, um, just given uh, the vast experience that, that our guest has with uh, environmental questions and environmentalism kind of more generally. So I'll start the questions if I could and invite you to, uh, to come up. Um, I was wondering, the, the kinds of things that you've been talking um, about these solutions, um, the, a lot of it has to do with changing people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And so what's kind of in the Nordic region, 
what is the the role of marketplace versus uh, legislative government you know kinds of programs um, I mean basically the question is how do you change people's behaviors what is the most effective way to do that and and how and, and how you answer that question how is that different than your understanding of, of how some of this might go down in the United States okay um, I think we have a different understanding of freedom um, I will say ours and you may ponder what is yours. But in, in Scandinavia, I think the, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to be, and I go to the social side, I, th I think it's utmost important that when we uh, take care of the environmental challenges, we think about social development as well. In the developing countries, a lot of the issues that environmental problems are creating affect the poorest. Climate change is actually worst today in countries like Mozambique or in Somalia because a lot of the droughts and heavy flooding they've been getting is due to climate change, and they have caused almost none of it. We have caused it in the industrialized countries, and they are paying for it. For it. So adaptation is a big issue there as well. And I'm just saying this because uh, one's freedom cannot take away from other people's freedoms. That I have a right to pollute is not a very lasting uh, view on freedom if that means that my children will have very high costs of trying to survive even in, in the same, same country. And that is something where we have to have a, a balance of, of, of uh, individual freedom and social justice and, and uh, e equality. And my understanding is when it comes to markets, we are often in, in, in the US and, and in Canada, where I visited before I came here, uh, left-wing solutions are kind of considered often as anti-market or kind of like that that's government should do everything and that's socialist. But I would just like to say that we Scandinavians, our markets and our people, we are quite flexible. Our, we, most of the, like everyday life is quite free in, in Scandinavia, also because safety is such so high that our kids can go by themselves to school, even walk two miles by themselves and there is no risk to them. You know, like 10 year old kids go to school three, three kilometers in Finland. And my understanding is that in many places in the rest of the world that would not happen. That would probably not be deemed as uh, proper parenthood. Um, and also everybody has good school, schools nearby them so you don't have to like have these elite schools and so on. So we have the similar approach to environmental issues that government and the public sector needs to create legislation which is progressive, which may create a market where those who have new solutions, that they, it's, it's possible for them to put them on the market as soon as possible. So we need a higher cost for uh, external, external utilities in, 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 in uh, consumption and, and production of, of, uh, of stuff, because environmental cost is not in the price of products, so we just try to put the environmental cost into the price of the product. We don't think the government should start to, you know, produce stuff themselves. We are not left-wing in that sense in Scandinavia, but we create rules where those companies who invest in new solutions, viable solutions, would win room, and the ones who are trying to hold back would need to step up and, and do more. So that's our approach, that we need legislation on having enough price for carbon, so we have to fix that in Europe. We would need legislation where companies are bound to uh, compensate if they create some environmental biodiversity problems, compensate it somewhere else by double the measure. And then they have, would have to minimize all the emissions that they create. That has to be in the legislation. And I would say that Finland has one of the world's best uh, capabilities in purifying water and measuring water quality and water quantities and that ha has actually come due to environmental legislation because we have such strict environmental legislation to industries that has created a new industry that is the water purification sector so it's kind of like uh, uh, it's actually an American professor Michael E. Porter who has this theory of, of about added value, and he has also spoken about environmental emissions, that emissions are not uh, a goal of uh, economic production. That is a side effect, which is kind of like, you don't want to have that. So it's also often, most often, productive to address the emissions and try to take away those, then you have a more effective production. 
So it's in the end also uh, economically wise. So my answer is that most solutions are government legislation and taxation which will help companies to do what they do best, innovation. But when it, when it comes to sectors where there is a, a need to have public kind of like overarching control or some kind of coordination, that is city planning. We just, not going into detail of this, but we all know that what happened in Houston was worse because of they didn't have city planning. So this is something which is in interest in all citizens in a city, that there is city planning. So with city planning, you can create easier ways of using pu public transportation, and public transportation should be, the system should be in public control, but the companies who run it can be private. That is our approach, for example. Because more or less, these are kind of like abstract issues to create markets. The government has to create rules and, and legislation which creates those markets. Then companies can uh, address those issues. Okay? I thought my question might be a waste of time, but maybe in this case. So in the beginning, there was you see the swamp and the shovel. Mm -hmm. So I'm a farmer, retired, and the drainage imperative for most of Finnish farms I saw seems like it would create quite a difficulty in managing runoff mm -hmm. chemicals. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Um. I think it's also important when we speak about environmental issues and uh, that environmentalism and taking responsibility of your actions. Often, like conservative politicians or sectors of economy like agriculture, uh, often people there, even in Finland, may kind of like feel that environmentalism is something that is against our interest or it is, it is something extreme somewhere. But the farmers who have always kind of like looked long into the future. They want to have their farm good, in good condition for their children and children's children. So they think, think about also about this nutrient balance and not allowing the nutrients to go into the sea and so on. So we have, what we have done is that we have created a subsidy system. We have a lot of subsidies for agriculture in Finland because we are in high latitudes. We need to have subsidies in order to have agriculture uh, uh, at all. And we think that there is still a national interest to have locally produced food. Uh, but we have quite high uh, levels of those subsidies go into environmental uh, actions. So basically, a farmer can choose from a set of, of uh, actions the ones which are most effective in his farm in order to address those issues. So he gets money for it. That's, that's what we do in short. And then we have to, done companies and legislation when it comes to the, the actual uh, fertilizer companies that their produ products, products would be uh, less, uh, uh, less uh, aggrieving to nature. So there have been a lot of uh, scientific breakthroughs break there as well. You we use a lot less chemicals and there are new solutions like using um, uh, alabaster to keep the nutrients in the ground. Uh, we have been using this as a kind of like, a, uh, it binds the ground tighter. So there are new solutions in, 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 in which are cheap to fix that. But I, I think it's most important thing is to show that this is something we do together. As an environmentalist, I never blame the, the farmers for creating emissions. Uh, it's not their fault that they are part of this economic system. We try to together find a new economic system where they can farm their products because Finnish people want to have locally produced food. If it's organic food, if it's uh, food that uh, you know uh, more kind of like supports a, a more healthy lifestyle, then they will buy it even more. So there is a, a, a benefit to all sides, consumers, farmers, and and legislators to find new ways of of addressing these issues. Yeah. Hey. Um, so. Uh, I just, um, I've been kind of spotty on kind of keeping track of um, where um, environmental issues are uh, succeeding and not succeeding in the U.S., but I know I uh, studied about 
um, like Leonardo DiCaprio, for example, he tried to present a plan with his um, CEO of his foundation to uh, the Trump administration about um, how we can uh, create a lot of jobs through mm -hmm. um, creating new, um, I mean, new kinds of work within uh, creating clean energy, mm -hmm. uh, clean like clean energy industries. Um, like I was also studying as well about how like I mean, if we were to say replace um, some of these uh, clean energy industries or some of the more uh, fossil fuel carbon related industries with these, um, there might be a lot of job displacement and. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who may not be trained to find another occupation, like, I don't know how the Scandinavian experience, like, and the U.S. experience are uh, kind of interrelated in that way, because mm -hmm. there's a much a higher focus on auto industry in the U.S., for example, but uh, what would your, I don't know, opinion be on that of yeah. how to create jobs and yet at the same time not pull a lot that, of people that's out a, of work? That, that's a very good question. I mean, there is also s always some creative chaos in terms of economy and somebody th in the short term there are uh, sometimes jobs at risk but those jobs are more at risk if we wouldn't address the environmental issues because then we would just be stuck on the kind of like old-fashioned jobs we need to keep those jobs I in the best manner possible by addressing environmental issues also in those f those areas mm -hmm. of industry so my basic answer to that is that there are no brown industries and green industries. The change needs to happen in all fields of industry uh, because they are not going to disappear. And, and I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. Actually, Finland is more like the US than the rest of Scandinavia in this sense because we have heavy industries. Mm -hmm. We build world's biggest cruisers. If you go to a cruise uh, on Caribbean, it's built in my hometown in Turku, the biggest ships in, in the uh, Royal Caribbean, whatever it's called, the company, the big company. Um, their Oasis of the Seas is built in, in my hometown and a few of the other big ships. And there was a discussion in Finland a few years ago if this is an old-fashioned brand. I admit that ch you, uh, specifically building cruise ships, it's not environmentally very smart to, you know, go on a cruise on a boat where you have loads of stuff. But you can make it environmentally better. And, and that is why they buy their ships in from Turku nowadays, because we have the least uh, emitting engines uh, when it comes to fossil fuel engines. And more and more of those ships built there use LNG, so gas instead of oil. Mm -hmm. And that uh, diminishes emissions as well. So there is going to be logistics in maritime travel. There is going to be people who want to go on cruises. We are trying to do it in Finland in the most environmentally friendly way possible. And that is what you should be do with your car industry as well. And, and then there are other fields of industry which will sell their new, totally new ideas into these branches. And I think in, when it comes to traffic, uh, mobility as a service is a very interesting field where you can kind of like get resource efficiency out of the you know, roads and, and traffic systems we have more by having more and more mobile services where you can, uh, one example of that is in Finland, and there we need legislation, that we have created a legislation where uh, any person buying a, a public transportation ticket uh, from their home to somewhere else in Finland, in no, I would say in the U.S. example, probably Utah is at the same scale. You couldn't do it in the whole of the U.S. US at one point. But in Utah, wherever from your home, you could buy one ticket online where it includes taxis, buses, trains, whatever you need on your way, and you have just one ticket and on one side, and you can you know, just get it online in five seconds. And that is a change which needs legislation, and that it, it needs uh, in, uh, infrastructure for all those companies to be in the same system. That is something we have created. And there's a lot of engineering and, and, and uh, programming skills and companies involved there as well. So you create jobs in the service industry by uh, limiting emissions on the traffic side. Everything becomes more effective. Perfect. Paljon kiitoksia. Kiitos. And I, one thing about that uh, industries as well, I remember Trump saying something about Pittsburgh losing jobs if we stay in the Paris deal, but I remember Pittsburgh mayor saying actually that there are more companies in Pittsburgh who actually benefit from the deal. So the reality is changing. Politicians often, even also in Finland, speak of the industries like they are in the 70s. They are not. They are so producing very smart solutions nowadays, 
and having more and more climate focus gives more edge to those companies who are doing their best. So, so it, it ha helps a lot of the companies. And a lot, a lot of companies are saying to politicians that you need to create the rules. We have the solutions. You just need to make the rules that we can put them on the market. Hi, uh, my name is Jared Meek. Um, studying biodiversity and conservation. Yep. Um, it, it seems to me that America is one of the, the few um, developed countries, at least, that are still in the public sphere debating on um, these types of issues, if they even are a problem or not. Um, whereas most of the rest of the developed world is acknowledging the problem, and, and most of the arguments are, what do we do about it? Um, what policies need to be put in place? I guess my question is, what, what percentage of, um, you talk a lot about in Finnish culture, what, what percentage of Finnish people acknowledge that climate change um, and these environmental issues is the primary issue mm -hmm. um, in, in their lives and in the future? And what are the main ar things still being argued about um, what applications to deal with that problem? Yeah. Um, my focus has been talking about environment. My other love is education. I think it's, that's something we share because you are here being educated at a high level. But I, my answer to most issues of having bad public debate, having bad politicians, not realizing what the facts are and acting accordingly, that we have to, even in Finland, uh, put more focus on education at also at the lower level. That is also a way in Europe to uh, address extreme right and those who are feel disfranchised uh, from the society, feel outside it, addressing poverty, that equal access to good education is, is a key. And then when you have educated population, they will make also smarter choices in, in politics, and politicians listen to public pressure. So I am, I have been trying to also use as we, I'm partly, I used to be partly just a Green Party, and we are one of the more popular Green Parties in, in, in the world. We have been in government for 13 years. We have now in polls, we have 17%. We are the second biggest party in whole of Finland in, in polls. It's a recent rise, but still, we've had ahead of the Social Democrats recently in polls. And I think it's due to also that we are making very clear of saying that addressing these environmental issues is also a patriotic responsibility, that we are protecting something which is very important to our tradition. And in Finnish tradition, also equal education is important, but nature is one big part of our story. So people maybe in Finland are less inclined to say no to scientists who say that climate change is a real threat because they have a, an everyday relationship to nature and they can see the changes in nature. It's always kind of like horrible to take this discussion in specific circumstances when you have extreme uh, weather events, but like the hurricane season this season, it cannot be avoided to, to discuss how bad they will get because the scientists are nowadays already saying that Climate science is not saying that you cannot link a specific weather event to climate change. That is not lo no longer true. You cannot uh, kind of like link it directly to the existence of it. But you can say that the probability of its existence and the strength of its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, effects and the longevity of its existence are caused and, and affected by, by climate change. And this is something that can be said, that since waters in the Caribbean are about 26 uh, degrees Celsius, I don't know what's in Fahrenheit, but that's the level of you know, creating hurricane conditions. If they are in a broader area uh, above that, even 80 meters below the surface, it will create a huge force. And, and uh, therefore, I think uh, if people are educated, if Politicians speak in a way where they think about ethical responsibility, which is longer for four years, the population will vote for it. But we have a few pro problems here, even in Finland. Political cycle is four years or even less sometimes, and, uh, and that is the issue that you have to also discuss yourself, that how you can make politicians also to take responsibility in the longer term, and not just looking at you know, two-year cycle problems and, and trying to get votes by not addressing the long, longer kind of lingering issues like climate change. But uh, 
But in Finland, in general, those who say that climate change doesn't exist are probably less than 20%. Uh, so, so we do have a better situation, but there exists those people. Uh, but also we are public discussion and, and we are media, so we can make sure that the majority of people uh, accept even stringent policies. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's three o'clock, so we're going to need to finish the formal part. If you have questions, you don't mind hanging around for a minute. Yeah. We can still take that. Join with me in thanking once again Finna Ninasa for being here. Thank you very much.